Good morning from Athens, Greece. It is around 9.20, I think. What time is it? Oh no, it is nine o'clock. It is nine o'clock from uh, Athens, Greece. And uh, let's talk about the news on this Sunday morning. I have got an update to, uh, to talk about with regards to Kaliningrad. Another update in what has become quite a, a drama between Lithuania and the EU and how they want to proceed with blockading or not blockading Kaliningrad. Let's do an update as well with what's going on in uh, Severodonetsk. And we've got an update there. We've got a meeting between Putin and Lukashenko of Belarus, and we'll wrap it up with a clown world. So let's discuss this Lithuania update and Kaliningrad update. So yesterday I was uh, talking about how the European Union in my afternoon video, I was talking about how the European Union was most likely going to throw Lithuania under the bus. There was panic in Brussels because a lot of high-level officials in the European Union, they did not want to uh, have conflict, to risk conflict with Russia over Lithuania and this uh, type of blockade of Kaliningrad. And so European Union officials were drafting documents um, and trying to figure out a way to, uh, to circumvent the fourth and fifth sanctions package that we're getting all the paperwork together to provide an off-ramp and say you know what uh, we're sanctioning Russia in all these ways but when it comes to transporting Russian goods inside of Russia or within Russia then there is uh, the sanctions package does not to not need to be adhered to we don't need to enforce it in other words the fact that Russia is transporting materials from the Russian Federation to Kaliningrad, which is also part of the Russian Federation. This should be seen as the transfer of goods inside domestically within Russia. And so the EU has no right to, uh, to enforce the sanctions package. They should not be enforcing the sanctions package. That's pretty much what the European Union, according to sources in Politico, was putting together and their excuse was something along the lines of, well, you know, Lithuania, they were just trying to, uh, to do as we were telling them and they took things a bit too far, but no harm, no foul. We're going to allow the, uh, the transportation of materials from Russia to Kaliningrad go through without any difficulties. Well, it looks like Lithuania is not agreeing with the EU's step to de-escalate this situation. And we have the Lithuanian president who is coming out with a statement posted on his Facebook page where he is saying that Lithuania will not compromise on the transit of sanctioned goods to Kaliningrad. In other words, the EU's plan to provide an off-ramp for this uh, Kaliningrad blockade escalation is not acceptable to Lithuania. So Gitanis Nausada, who is the president of, uh, of Lithuania, said that Lithuania will not make concessions on the issue of transit of sanctioned goods to Russia's enclave in Kaliningrad region. Quote, it is perfectly clear that Lithuania must and will apply the EU sanctions. Lithuania must and will maintain control over the goods transported via its territory and any corridors are out of the question just as concessions to Russia are out of the question. The government should immediately begin consultations with the European Commission so that the imposed sanctions don't harm either the interests of Lithuania or international agreements <laughs> so Lithuania wants to escalate 
Lithuania wants to continue to escalate this situation, even though the European Union is saying we don't want any part of this. The European Union comes up with these fourth and fifth package, uh, sanctions packages against Russia. Lithuania decides, probably via the directive of NATO, the United States, and the European Union, they decide that they are going to cause some trouble in Kaliningrad and create this type of quasi blockade of, uh, of Russian goods from being transported to an enclave that is part of the Russian Federation, circumventing, breaking treaties that Lithuania had previously agreed to and had previously signed. So they're breaking international law as well if you go by the treaties that Lithuania agreed to. But anyway, they decide to come up with this idea, the EU, the US, NATO, and Lithuania, to, uh, to cause some trouble for Russia with regards to Kaliningrad. Russia comes out and says, look, if you continue down this road with this nonsense, we're gonna hit back. And we're gonna hit back in all kinds of ways. And one of those ways, who knows, it could be Militarily, it could be via, via various other uh, economic tools that we have at our disposal, energy tools that we have at our disposal, who knows? And the EU, rightly, rightly so, decides, you know, it's not worth it. It is not worth starting World War III over a blockade of Kaliningrad, which the Russians are going to circumvent anyway. So the EU decides that they're going to come up with an off-ramp. Yeah, the off-ramp throws Lithuania under the bus a bit, but uh, because the EU is kind of saying it's not really our fault, Lithuania is just doing as we told them. Okay, it kind of turns Lithuania into a little bit of, uh, of a fool, but it, uh, it averts World War III. So you can go down the steps, this nice church here. This is an interesting road because there's this rock right here and it blocks off the uh, the road. So you have to actually, you have to actually be careful, you know, looking back of you as you walk and kind of walk around the rock. And there's also tram tracks. So you have to be careful of the tram as well. So there's an interesting sidewalk in Athens and you know, careful of the tram, it says. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> I think that's one of the most interesting sidewalks uh, in this city. So, um, yes, <laughs> so the EU is trying to get out of this mess and uh, avert World War III. And Lithuania is saying, nah, uh-uh. No chance. We want to escalate with Russia. World War III sounds good to us. <laughs> of course, this could be just Lithuania, the president of Lithuania calling the EU's bluff, kind of saying, you're not going to uh, throw us under the bus because you ordered us to do this and now you're trying to, uh, to pin the blame on us for this debacle. It could be a kind of uh, a poker move from the president of Lithuania as well. Another, another uh, option that, uh, that we could be looking at is maybe NATO or the United States said, um, no, nah, don't listen to the EU, uh, Lithuania, and just continue to escalate with Russia. Don't worry, we've got your back. <laughs> so it could be, <laughs> who knows what it could be. It could be NATO or the US telling Lithuania, look, continue to escalate. It could be the Lithuanian president saying, you're not gonna throw us under the bus. I'm gonna call your bluff. Or it could be just Lithuania saying, you know, we're ready to take on Russia. Bring it on. So, yeah, <laughs> what a crazy story this has become. There is no plan coming out of the collective West with how to deal with Russia. There is no plan. They're just trying all different things. Let's stir up trouble in Georgia. Let's stir up trouble in Moldova. Let's see what we can do in Kaliningrad. And uh, nothing is working out. 
because Russia continues to call their bluff. And uh, you begin to realize that there is no real coordination that is taking place at these uh, very high levels between the EU, the member states, NATO, the United States. They're kind of agreeing to do something, but they don't think, they don't coordinate to think like three or four steps further down the line. They just kind of coordinate to, uh, to agree on how they think they're going to, uh, to embarrass or punish Russia. They get to that level and they say, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's blockade Kaliningrad. But they, they don't think three or four steps further down. So anyway, that is the latest update with regards to uh, Kaliningrad and, uh, and Lithuania. Let's do an update with Severodonetsk. And we have the news coming from the Russian Ministry of Defense that Severodonetsk is 100% uh, liberated. That's what the Russian Ministry of Defense, that's the word they use, including the azot uh, plant. The, uh, the chemical plant has also now been liberated. The interesting news about this, uh, this announcement from the Russian Ministry of Defense is that you have 800, at this moment in time, you have 800 civilians who were trapped in uh, the azot plan, who, uh, the azot plant, who are now uh, coming out and have now been freed. So we're talking about 800 people being held hostage by the, uh, by the Ukraine military in this plant. That is a lot of people. That is a lot of hostages. And that is how the, uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense and how Donbass are uh, reporting this. Um, you can choose to believe the Russian MOD or, or the Donbass militia or not, but they're reporting that the, uh, the chemical plant, the azot plant, had 800 and maybe even more, 800 plus civilian hostages trapped in that plant. And um, when the Russian Ministry of Defense, when they say that something has been liberated or is in Russian control, they mean that the Russians fully control it, like every aspect, and it is not going back. When the Russians say they control something with regards to this conflict in Ukraine, they mean that this, uh, this territory is completely under their control and there is not going to be anything that uh, Elensky or NATO or the U.S., anything short of nuclear war, that they'll be able to do to return this territory back to uh, Kiev. And um, there's a bit of a blame game going on in Kiev with regards to the withdrawal from Severodonetsk because when we saw the, uh, the surrender at Azov style in Mariupol, the Alensky regime and the mainstream media script writers, the Western, the collective West mainstream media script writers, what, uh, what they did is they crafted the narrative of the Azov style evacuation. With Azot, Azot uh, factory, it looks like the Alensky regime is very pissed off because they didn't have time to craft a narrative and to brand this as a tactical retreat. We saw the Wall Street Journal article yesterday, which kind of hinted at the, uh, the narrative that Alensky and his team of producers and Hollywood and the think tanks in London and DC and all the script, all the script writers, what they were looking to create was a narrative of a tactical retreat. You know, this wasn't a big deal. Severodonetsk was not a big deal. This was not a really big loss. This was a tactical retreat as Alensky plans for his big counteroffensive in August, where uh, the Ukraine military will not only take back the territory lost to Russia, but they will take back Donbass and Crimea and eventually begin the uh, march on Moscow. That's how they wanted to, to paint the, uh, the loss in Severodonetsk and the, um, the loss of the Azot plant. But it seems like they didn't have time to fully develop this narrative and to distribute it across uh, social media and the mainstream media because a lot of journalists 
And this is where the blame game comes in because a lot of journalists on the ground, including Ukrainian and Western journalists, were reporting of the situation in Severodonetsk weeks and days before the, uh, the eventual announcement came from the Ukraine Ministry of Defense and the Russian Ministry of Defense that Severodonetsk is lost, 100% lost, and the Azot plant has been uh, fully taken over by the Russian military. And you have Ukraine's defense ministry actually coming out with a statement yesterday and blaming social media commenters and Ukrainian and Western journalists for reporting on the situation in Severodonetsk way too early and thus ruining the Ukraine government's narrative with regards to Severodonetsk and what happened in Severodonetsk. And you have the Ukraine Ministry of Defense coming out and saying military operations can be partly disrupted by civilians who publicly demonstrate awareness of the course of military operations and report on them on social networks before the general staff makes an official statement like yesterday and the day before in Severodonetsk. It disrupted the armed forces of Ukraine from finishing what was planned. Now, according to the Ukraine Ministry of Defense, the comments steal time away from the Ukraine military that could have been used implementing their plans and maneuvers in secrecy. Quote, everything that is allowed to talk about at the given moment, at the given moment is stated by official sources, the general staff and the Ministry of Defense. This is according to, I believe, uh, Malier, who is, I believe she is the deputy uh, Minister of Defense, or she's the spokesperson for the Ministry of Defense. But um, she also blamed a journalist called Yuri Utusov as someone who reported way too, or, way too early and accurately on <laughs> Severodonetsk, and this kind of spoiled the Ukraine uh, military's maneuvers and operations with regards to Severodonetsk, according to the Ukraine uh, ministry statement. So they're actually even pointing, uh, pointing out a journalist who they feel reported on what was going on in Severodonetsk too early, and this hampered the Ukraine Ministry of Defense is, uh, is ability to, to properly, I guess, execute this tactical retreat, I guess is what they're, uh, they're upset about. But um, this is really all about controlling the narrative. That's what this is all about. And when you have journalists who are reporting what is going on on the ground before the Alensky regime and the collective West has time to, uh, to shape and control the narrative, well, this leads to, to debacles like Severodonetsk, where everyone now knows that this was a terrible, terrible defeat and a big blow to the, to the Ukraine military. And uh, Alensky doesn't have time to properly propagandize the collective West and actually have them believe that this was a tactical retreat much like they actually have people in the collective West believe that Azov style was indeed an evacuation. So that is the update with Severodonetsk. Let's get to some news with regards to Putin and uh, Lukashenko, Belarus. Putin was meeting with, uh, with the president of Belarus the other day. And for the first time, Putin informed Lukashenko that Russia has approved supplying Belarus with nuclear-capable long-range missiles. Minsk has long offered to host Russian nukes as a deterrent against the West, a prospect which Lukashenko had very provocatively offered even in the months leading up to the February 24th invasion of Ukraine. And according to Zero Hedge, this move will likely be viewed from Washington as a first step in moving toward a heightened nuclear posture in Eastern Europe. Now, according to Reuters, this announcement from Putin and Lukashenko means that Russia will supply Belarus with Iskander-M 
missile systems. Russian President Vladimir Putin told a televised meeting with Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko on Saturday that delivery will take place within a few months. Putin referenced nuclear capability according to a transcript of the televised remarks. In the coming months, we will transfer to Belarus Iskander M tactical missiles, which can use ballistic or cruise missiles in their conventional and nuclear versions. The Reuters report underscores further that the Iskander M is a mobile guided missile system with a range of up to 500 kilometers, 300 miles. The missiles can carry conventional or nuclear warheads. Currently, Putin and Lukashenko are meeting face to face in St. Petersburg for the 30th anniversary of the two countries establishing diplomatic relations, which eventually led to the so-called Union State Pact of 1999 and has persisted until now, which also enabled Russia to muster much of his forces on Belarusian territory just ahead of the Ukraine invasion. This is according to Reuters. So Putin is signaling not that they're going to put nuclear weapons, that they're going to host nuclear weapons in Belarus, but they're going to host missile systems that have the capability of becoming nuclear, of having nuclear warheads. So it is not a guarantee that there's going to be nuclear weapons in Belarus, but there are going to be systems that could carry nukes in Belarus. And this is going to freak out the collective West, which NATO does have missiles. And from what I understand, nuclear missiles, which are hosted in, uh, I believe, in Romania and Poland. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are the missiles that are in Poland and Romania, are those nuclear or are those nuclear capable systems? Maybe, maybe nuclear capable systems. But it looks like that Putin is just pretty much doing exactly the same thing that NATO is doing in Poland and in Romania, which is we are going to put systems in place that are nuclear capable without saying if there are actual nuclear weapons there. But either way, this is going to freak out the collective West and they are going to start pushing out a narrative that Russia is moving their uh, nuclear capabilities westward and the Russian Federation is expanding westward with nuclear weapons right on Europe's doorstep. That is going to be the narrative that you're going to hear from the collective West. Another quick narrative that is coming out from the, uh, from the Ukraine Ministry of Defense with regards to Belarus is that on Saturday in the northern Chernihiv region, there was massive bombardment from rockets fired from the territory of Belarus and from the air. And the uh, Ukraine Ministry of Defense is saying that this is a major cross-border attack from Belarusian territory. Ukraine intelligence, Russian bombers fired cruise missiles from Belarus for the first time. According to the Ukraine Ministry of Defense, on the night of June 25th, a massive missile and bomb strike was carried out on the territory of Ukraine from Belarusian airspace during which six Tu-22M3 were used. According to a statement from Ukrainian intelligence, quote, today's strike is directly linked to Kremlin efforts to pull Belarus as a co-belligerent into the war in Ukraine. So that is a statement from the uh, Ukraine Ministry of Defense saying that Russia is attacking Ukraine from Belarusian territory and that this would make Belarus a type of co-belligerent. I guess much in the same way that Poland could be categorized a co-belligerent by Russia, as well as Romania, as well as uh, Greece, as well as the United States, as well as Canada, as well as Czechia, as well as Germany and France. So if we're going to start labeling co-belligerents, well, but I think that uh, if Belarus is labeled a co-belligerent in this conflict alongside Russia, then I think there's about 30 countries in the European Union and in North America that uh, could easily be labeled co-belligerents uh, alongside Ukraine in this conflict with, uh, with Russia. So 
that is the story there and let's do a final quick clown world and this clown world one second as i cross the street here very dangerous to read articles or to look at your phone as you're crossing the street <laughs> anyway this article here comes from um france 24 it's a video and not a post not an article but a video from france 24 and this video is it's a troubling video because it shows the uh the evacuation in lizzie chansk or at least it's trying to document the evacuation in lizzie chansk as the russian army is approaching and i guess you have uh ukraine uh officials volunteers who are going to evacuate the um, the residents of Lysychansk to to the Ukraine uh, side of the conflict, and as France twenty four is um, is documenting this, about a minute a minute and twenty seconds into this video, and I'll put a link for the video down below. France twenty four starts interviewing residents in Lysychansk. And I mean, it's a real tragedy what's going on. Um, it's terrible what's happening there because, you know, people are being forced to, uh, to leave their homes. And uh, the people that France 24 interviews, they're actually coming out and saying, I'm looking forward, and I'm paraphrasing here, I'm looking forward for the Russians to, uh, to come and take Lysychansk. I see the Russians as friends, one, uh, one woman says in the interview. She actually says that I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to the Russians to come and save us, something along those lines, and the Russians are our friends. And another woman says that it's the Ukraine uh, military that is shelling. These are, these are the interviews that France 24, uh, the, the propaganda arm of the French government, this is their video interview, and these are the statements of the people that they are interviewing in Lysychansk who are supposed to be evacuated from the, uh, from the city. And so I'm curious as to why France 24 did not edit these interviews out. That's one question that I have. Why didn't they just edit? the last 30 seconds of this uh, of this report. Why did they let this air? Because it paints the Russians as as liberators, according to to the interview with uh, with the residents of Lysychansk. And um, why, why why did France 24 decide to to air this? Why did they decide to actually publish this? It really has me uh, a bit puzzled, to, to, to be quite honest. Is, is this once again some trickle truth where the collective West mainstream media is, is slowly, slowly starting to report the reality of what's happening in, uh, in the Donbass? Oh my God. Opa. Um, it's very odd. That this, uh, that this report saw the light of day. This video report saw the light of day. But um, it is what it is. I think that France 24 was perhaps expecting that uh, they would be interviewing residents and those residents would be saying, you know, that, uh, that Ukraine is going to be the ones that are gonna be saving them and uh, liberating them. And it turns out that the residents in Lysychansk see things very differently. Anyway. That is where I will leave this video for today. Let me know your thoughts. Why do you think France 24 decided to actually uh, leave these interviews uh, in the video that they put out with regards to the evacuation of residents from Lysychansk? What do you think is, uh, is the reason for that? And um, the Duran.locals.com check out Alexander's channel, check out the Duran's channel, and uh, go to the Duran shop, 10% off, use the code good day, pick up a Duran t-shirt, and I am signing out.
from a very noisy, sunny, busy Saturday, Sunday, <laughs> busy Sunday morning here in Athens, Greece. Take care.